And if you are joining us online, either now that you are listening to me or you are joining and you are listening to the recorded version of this message, I want you to know that God will also be reaching you where you are. You are welcome. This is LifeGate Church. We are physically based in Walsall in the West Midlands of the United Kingdom. But we are thankful to God that today we can reach you right where you are. And um, God is faithful. So we just want to thank God for what he's doing with us. Uh, I want to say that um, by the grace of God, we are starting what I call nine special Sundays. These Sundays are special not just because, you know, we, we just decide to make them so, but because we're going to be looking at what truly makes a Christian a Christian. And so the theme of the special Sunday uh, that we'll be going through, the special Sundays, nine special Sundays that we'll be going through, is the uniqueness of Christ. The uniqueness of Christ. And I want to encourage you, wherever you are, that please do everything you can to be a part of these nine meetings, because God will be speaking to us in diverse ways. The whole essence of Christianity is Christ. And if we understand who he is and why he's unique, why he is not like any other human being that ever lived this earth or is living on this earth, it changes our way of worship. It changes our relationship. It affects our relationship and helps us to consolidate on everything that we have known. And so I want to encourage you to please stay very active and be a part of this. May God continue to bless you in Jesus' name. If I can have our banner today, I'll just explain to you what we'll be looking at in the course of the nine weeks that will be uh, coming starting from today. Now, that is our banner that is just telling us there are in about six different main topics because some of the topics we will take two times. We'll have a part one and part two. For example, we will have the supremacy of Christ in two parts. So today is part one uh, because these things are so deep to exhaust and uh, we cannot exhaust them in one session but we'll do our best to see what we can fit into the two sessions. So we'll look at the supremacy of Christ in two sessions, this week and next week. And then in the third and the fourth week, we'll be looking at the perfect high priest. That takes us through four sessions of the nine. And then we'll have one session on the new and better covenant in Christ. And then we'll have another two sessions on the heritage of faith in Christ. And then we will have one more session in uh, living faithfully in Christ and another one session in Christ the Shepherd, uh, which will be on the last Sunday of June, by the grace of God. So please uh, get ready, and I want to encourage you to read, especially if you are a member and you are a minister in any way, uh, in the early morning prayers, or you'll be taking some of the midweek sessions, dip your head into the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is our bus stop for this month, this couple of months, and we'll be exploring that wonderful book that was written around about AD 70, something like that. But to the glory of God remains one of the most potent uh, uh, descriptions and uh, vivid expressions and explanations of who Christ is, and particularly for those of us who received him after he had already left and uh, trans, trans, was translated into glory. And so I want to just encourage us. So this theme, this session is themed the supremacy of Christ, part one. And this is basically examining the basics of his supremacy. So in this session, we just want to look at the basics of his supremacy. Now, this is a teaching session, um, but because of time, we will just have to quote some scriptures that I would hope you would write down. So if you don't have your notepads or something to write with, so please get those and note those things because you will need to go through them again to give you a firm grasp. One of the reasons why Christians cannot confidently share the faith and are easily blown away by basic questions is because we, we just don't know. We just don't know. We have good intentions, we have faith in Christ, but we need to know who he is and why he is supreme. We need to understand this because it gives us an assurance of our salvation even the more. So when we talk about the supremacy of Christ, we're talking about the doctrine that makes Christ God, as simple as that. The doctrine that says Jesus is God. Now, this is the doctrine that separates Christianity from any other. If we must say Christianity is a religion, it's what separates it from any other religion. There are many religions and many faiths that accept him as 
a prophet. They accept him as being born of a virgin birth. They accept him as somebody who is a historical figure, powerful historical figure. Every one of them accepted that he lived about 2,000 years ago on the face of the earth. But not everyone, in fact, only Christianity and the followers of Christ accept him as equivalent to God. And we need to understand that the, the whole essence of our faith is pinned on this acceptance of Jesus, not just as the Son of God that manifested on earth, but as God himself, being a part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we, to affirm our faith, we affirm his supremacy that he is God indeed. When the word supreme is looked at in dictionary, the Merriam-Webster dictionary calls the uh, defined supreme as the highest in rank, in authority, in quality, in degree. Basically saying it is the ultimate. That is why in our justice systems all over the world, in our judicial systems all over the world, there is something called the Supreme Court. And when every other court has tried a case and there's just no way to broker it, it is taken to that highest court in the land, which is called the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court takes a decision, then it can no longer be upturned unless there is an execution order by a, 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 a governing authority that is also subject, as it were, to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court decisions are final because they are regarded as the ultimate courts in the land. So when we talk about the supremacy of Christ, we're talking about him being ultimate. We are talking about him being above all, above human, above angels, above demons, above all. And when we understand him this way, it helps us to know why we pray to him. It helps us to know why we pray to the Father through him. It helps us to know why we call on his name. It helps us to know why we, we believe in him. It helps us to know why we proclaim him as the author of our salvation. So Jesus' supremacy over all is expressed throughout the entire scriptures, but particularly in the book of Hebrews, as I said earlier on, this book was written to Jewish believers, Jewish converts, who at a point were not too sure. They were, they, were, they were kind of persecuted, so they didn't really know their standing. They were persecuted by the traditional Jews who did not accept Jesus Christ as Messiah and as Lord and Savior. And so this book was written to help them to be established in the faith. And I see a resemblance of what was said to these Jewish Christians in a way to our world of today. There are many people who are going through one form of persecution or the other, and their faith is shaken, just like these Jewish Christians, their faiths were shaken at that time. Our faith is shaken, and we need to understand why our faith should not be shaken. That's why the entire book of, the, of, of Hebrews talks about this uniqueness of Christ, being supreme, being the perfect high priest, having to bring a new and a better covenant. It talks about him giving us a heritage of faith in Christ. And it talks about him helping us to live faithfully even in him. And then it, it talks about him being our great shepherd. So Hebrews explains all that. Paul gave some insight into this in his writings. He talked to the Philippians about Jesus having a name above every other name. He talked a lot to the Colossians. And for this session, this part one session, I'd like you to read Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 2. Hebrews 1, Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2. Today we just read Hebrews 1, the whole chapter, but Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 2 is where we're focusing this theme today. And also read Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 23. That was Paul's understanding. Now, the book of Hebrews has its authorship unknown, and it's as simple as that. I don't want to waste too much time on that, but you can find a lot of literature and a lot of work that theologians have done to try to explain who wrote this book. Uh, 
very, very few people ever thought it was Paul. Most people agree that it does not sit in the pattern of the writings of Paul, and it sat at a time when Paul must have actually been martyred because it was referring to, at some points, referring to those who had shed, who, who had resisted the purge onto shedding of blood. And so the, 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 the estimation was that the likes of Peter and Paul must have been martyred by the time Hebrews was written. So Hebrews was one of the last to be written uh, New Testament books. But the, the, the reality of the, of the fact is that the, the, the whole compendium, as it sounds, because in many places it reads like a we, uh, seems to have been a collection of many things that many of these uh, Jewish believers who were matured and could, who could speak to the others were able to write and compile from what they understood from the Torahs and the Old Testament and the writings that had gone before them in the epistles that Paul had written to the likes of Philippi, to the likes of Colos, and to the, to the Thessalonians and so on and so forth. So this book helps us to understand first and foremost why Christ is supreme. And by the establishment of this supremacy in Christ, we are able to see the author and establish him as the one who has his priesthood, his kingdom, his covenant, and the author of our salvation. And so that's our banner, a very long explanation of it, but um, that's what we'll be seeing over the next nine weeks as we progress by the grace of God. I want to just quickly, from Hebrews chapter 1, even though I did say read the entire chapter 1 and the entire chapter 2, we're going to really concentrate on Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 4. That's how much we can take today uh, for, for this session in part 1. And then throughout the week, by the grace of God, we'll be expounding more on those things uh, right from tomorrow morning right through to Friday and our Bible studies. And um, in Hebrews chapter 1, I want to give us some nine proofs from scripture that helps us, that should help us to understand the supremacy of Christ, why he's supreme, and why he, we as believers must accept his supremacy and live by his supremacy and declare his supremacy, not just for our own lives, but for those that we share the faith with. In Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 and verse 2, Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 and verse 2, not Hebrews 2, thank you. It said, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. God who at various times, back to verse 1, thank you, and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. He said, has in these last days, talking about the very day that we're in, right from that time to the very day that we're in until we will be, till he comes again, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And I just want to quickly pitch my tent on a few of the proofs, three of those proofs I want to bring out from this verse alone. The Bible says he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And that son he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. The first thing I would like to say is a proof there is the fact that Christ is referred to as the son of God. Undisputedly, the son of God. He has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So we must understand that Christ is the son of God through whom God made the world and through whom God spoke and has been given the heir of all things. This means that we must accept his salvation. Jesus Christ, the son himself, in John 14, 6, you don't have to turn to it, but write it down, and if you, you, you would know it before, but write it down for your reflection. John 14, 6, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. And when he spoke to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
So Jesus did not hide the fact that he was speaking to man. He came and he spoke to man about salvation. And this is very important. He by himself, every prophet, the Bible says, go back to verse 1. The Bible says, before now, God at various times, through the likes of Moses, through the likes of Joel, through the likes of Joshua, through the likes of Samuel, through the likes of Malachi, spoke to us through Daniel, through prophets. He spoke to our fathers. But in these last days, he is speaking to us through his son, verse 2. In these last days, he's speaking to us through his son. Every prophet that came before Jesus, everything they said spoke to, spoke to our fathers by, as a way of the, manifest, the coming manifestation of Jesus and what was going to happen even after he resurrected and what we now call the end time. So we must understand that we cannot neglect the salvation that has been given because Jesus himself spoke of it. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Verse 2, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Verse 3, How shall we escape? How shall we escape? If we neglect... So great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus himself, and was now confirmed to us by those who heard him. This is one of the proofs that make us understand that it's not Paul that wrote it, because Paul also heard Jesus, and Peter, especially James and John, could not have been because they heard him, so they couldn't have been, they couldn't have been referring to those who heard him again. Paul heard Jesus, obviously, after Jesus resurrected Paul, Jesus manifested to Paul, uh, man, uh, yeah, manifested to Paul on the way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. But these people, the writers of Hebrews, said that it was confirmed, was first spoken by the Lord Jesus himself. When Jesus came, he said, I am the way. I am what you have been waiting for. And then the Bible says, those who heard him also further on went to confirm it to them. He said, how shall we escape? And this is what we must understand, that salvation through Jesus is a non-negotiable. When Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, he said, Neither is there any name whereby men must, must be saved but the name Jesus Christ. So why do we need to remind ourselves of this? Because we are living in a world now where many people are actually confused. Many people are wondering why the authentication of Jesus Christ. He did not just come. He spoke about himself as the heir of salvation. He spoke about himself as the sacrifice. He spoke about himself as the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says we cannot escape if we neglect so great a salvation. And so we must be rest assured that Christ as the Son of God is the one through whom God has spoken in these last days and is still speaking to us. What this means is that everything about our salvation, we know that Jesus Christ is the word that, was, that became flesh. And uh, we know that everything that we read in the word of God today still talks about Jesus Christ in the diverse forms that he had been referred to or that he referred to himself or that he was referred to after he left in the epistles and the books of the New Testament. That is in the gospels, the epistles and other books of the New Testament. Praise the Lord. And so we are grateful to God for this. That's the first thing we want to recognize from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. The other thing we want to recognize is the last phrase there that the Bible says, he has appointed him heir, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. He had appointed him heir of all things and that God made the world through Christ. So I want to just quickly take the last bit. Through whom he also made the worlds. This means Christ is also creator. Christ is creator. And therefore, if he's creator, he created all things. This is why we must worship him. We must not worship what he created. This is why we must not worship nature. We must not worship carved images. We must not worship those things that God created. We must not worship trees. 
We appreciate trees. We appreciate the things that God put for us in nature. But we must not worship anything created directly by nature or that we created with our own hands. We must not worship anything. And some of us may say, but pastor, I don't worship any of those things. I know I shouldn't. But then the same things apply to our jobs. It applies to our family. It applies to our spouses. We cannot worship our spouses because the spouses were also created. We cannot worship our children. We cannot worship our parents. We cannot worship our pastors and church leaders. No human being, no created being, no created object must ever take the place of Jesus. The Bible says, put it back on the screen, Hebrews 1, 2. The Bible says, through whom the worlds were created. Through whom the worlds were created. All the earth must worship and sing unto his name. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, all the earth must worship and give him glory. Because only him who created all things deserves to be worshipped by those that he created. Even the winds and the seas obey him because he is the creator of the winds. He is the creator of the seas. So we as Christians must know why we direct our worship to Jesus. We worship the, 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 we worship the Godhead through Jesus because we are those who accept his supremacy over everything created. Today, we are living in a world where people are finding it difficult to separate the expanse of science and medicine from that which is the wisdom of God. Whilst God gave man wisdom to be able to be scientific, to be able to have understanding of medical science and to have the understanding of technology and all those things that we see and are truly marvels in many cases, we must never forget that none of those things should take the place of God and none of those things should take the place of the worship of Jesus. And so it is foolhardy to say that there are answers and specific things that any of those things can do that takes it away from that who created the wisdom and who created the things that we, be, we see around us. The third thing he said in Hebrews 1-2 is that Christ is the heir of all things. Christ is the heir of all things. Go back to Hebrews 1, 2, please. Christ is the heir of all things. And this simply means that it is him that takes everything. All things were created through Christ. And as the heir, all things were created for him. This is why we must understand that when we pray, we subject ourselves to him. He created us for himself. He created everything for himself. And the Bible says that he has appointed him heir of all things. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 makes a clear description when Paul wrote this to the uh, Colossians. Colossians 1 16. The Bible says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. What does that mean? If something was created for him, we have, we who have become joint heirs with him have the right and have the authority to make sure that everything confines to him. This is why we pray. This is what makes our prayer to him and through him potent and effective. Until we understand this, we will pray like anybody else. We will say things that do not carry the power and the authority they should carry because we can subject everything to him because everything was created for him. What do I mean by that? If you see a person who is suffering an ailment and is limited, you have the authority, I have the authority to present that person and that thing again to him. You can present your marriage to him. Your marriage was created by him for him. Your home was created by him for him. Your job was created by him for him. What do I mean by that? It means that every time you see a threat of the enemy trying to make it his property, you can say, Lord, this matter was created by you for you. And as long as we have this understanding that he's the heir of all things and we can present everything back to him, we live in the place of authority and perpetual dominion. Christians have become weaker and weaker because we do not understand some of these simple truths. 
You live a confident life when we, you recognize that he had created all things and all things were created through him and it was also created for him. So the devil has no right to steal anything. Jesus Christ said he has come to try to steal it. He has come to try to kill and he has come to try to destroy. But he said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come to remind them that all things are mine and all things belong to me. So this is the third proof that we have to have and we need to be reminded of every time if we want to enjoy the supremacy of Christ. Then we go to verse 3. We're going to take five proofs from verse 3, Hebrews 1, 3. Many powerful truths that were said in describing the supremacy of Christ in this place. The first thing is that the Bible says, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had sat down by himself, purged our sins and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'll break them to the five that we can take from that verse. The first thing is that the Bible says that Christ is the brightness of his glory. Christ is the brightness of his glory. Christ reflects the splendor of God. We always say the splendor of the king clothed in majesty. But the truth is that it is Christ that came and displayed that splendor. And then after he left, we continue to contact that splendor as we read the word of God. It is important for us to understand that we can see the splendor of, of Christ. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, the Bible says, For in him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This means that through him we have access to the Father and the Spirit. Through the word of God we have access to the Father, the heart of the Father, and we have access to the Spirit who is our comforter today through the word of God. For in him, when he came physically, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So much so that when he had to die, the Father just for the moment had to look away and take himself as it were, even though they cannot be separated. He had to take himself to allow the son to die. That's why Jesus said, my, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Because in him was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then today we have the word which still has the fullness of the Godhead bodily. As believers and as those who name the name of the Lord, we must understand the supremacy of the word of God. The Bible, the word of God, is not just a historical book. The word of God is not just a book that compiles things that have been said by men. It is a book that, inspired, that is inspired of the Holy Ghost and presents Jesus to us in such a way that every time we go into the world, we are experiencing, we are allowing ourselves to experience the brightness of his glory. We are allowing ourselves to experience the brightness of his glory. The Bible says every time in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, every time we go in, we are looking into the word and that we are being transformed from one image of glory onto the other. From one image of glory onto the other. Things drop off, off our lives. Shackles drop off our lives when we go into the word of God by faith and receive of this brightness of the glory of God. Our lives never remain the same because we are contacting of the brightness of his glory. Our lives become more radiant. Our lives become more stable. Our lives become more achieving and overcoming and triumphant. We must understand that none of that stops the temptations and trials of this life from, from, from coming. But it puts us in a place of total assurance. It puts us in a place of total rest. How many of you have, have ever been in a, in a place where you have a ticket or you have something that you know of a truth without a, a, a shadow of doubt that is yours or a receipt for something? And you are now being told that that thing does not belong to you or you cannot access. You, you know that the confidence you have because you have your ticket in your hand, because you have your receipt in your hand, the confidence you have is different from the person who is not sure whether their receipt is on them or not. Your, your confidence is, is different from the person who is not sure whether they actually got the original or not. When you know you've got the original, you stay at rest. 
I remember many years ago, about 16 years ago now, we're 2003, yeah, 14 years ago, I went to represent the University of Wolverhampton in the country of Ghana, in the West Africa, Nigeria, in West Africa, West of Africa. I went to Nigeria, Ghana, and Cameroon. I used to go like that, those, those times, to help the university recruit international students. And I did that for a few years uh, until business models changed and so on and so forth. But then, I was in Ghana. And at that time, I wasn't yet a British citizen. I was just somebody who, I was on a, on a, on a visa, on a, I was on a work visa. So I had a Nigerian passport only. So I, was, I finished business in, in Lagos in Nigeria and then flew to Accra in Ghana and I was to fly back to London by British Airways or something like that at that time. And uh, the person held my passport and he looked at me and he said to me, he said, this visa is invalid. I said, how do you mean? He said, I'm sorry, this visa is not valid. I sat there looking at him. I said, you, you can't be serious. <laughs> because I did not send that passport to the British High Commission when I got the visa about three years before. I did not send that passport to the, to the High Commission through anybody. So that could have gone somewhere else to do something fake for me. I went to the High Commission myself, sat there and got the thing myself. So there, there, was, there was no way it could have been fake because I, 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 and I was so sure. So the guy was surprised that the way he was trying to create a scene, I was not moved. I was just looking at him. I said, look, this visa you are looking at, as at, as at that time, it had been to many African countries, it had been to Canada, it had been to America. In, by 2003, I had it in 2000, between that three years, it had been to all those places. And nobody has ever picked it. That you must have a very sophisticated system here to say that this is invalid. <laughs> and he looked at me and he was shocked. And I said, look, if I miss my flight, you guys are going to have to pay. And I'm not going to go on economy. <laughs> he was just looking at me. What's wrong with this guy? Because I knew that there's just no way it could have been fake. There's no way. I was convinced. I was convinced beyond every reasonable doubt. So they went and called all their people and then put it on. They said, oh, we're very sorry, sir. It's our mistake. And all that. I took my passport to say, you had better be. You had better be. I've had it a few times like that. There was a time I was in Zambia. I'm just reminded now. And, and even my British passport, this was 2012. Even my British passport, somebody put it on a machine and said it was fake. I sat down there looking at them because I know it's not. So what I'm trying to say is that when you know, if you know Christ, if you have this understanding that he is the brightness of his glory, when you get a revelation from the word of God, it adds to you something that takes you beyond the realm of doubt. It takes you to a level whereby you no longer act like base people, like people who are still guessing. This is the essence of this series. To come to an understanding of this uniqueness of Christ that you are so confident, like I talked about my passport just now, you are so confident that even if the, it's the devil is telling you things, you just be there. And say, no, this cannot happen to me. This cannot happen to my child. This cannot happen to my family. This cannot happen to my job. You come that way, and it's not in arrogance. It's not in arrogance. It's just in deep Revelation and understanding. That is what made Jesus himself sleep in a boat when everybody else was shouting. We must all understand these truths so that it can help us. He said he is in the brightness of his glory. Then it takes me to the next point. The Bible says he is the express image of his person. That's another very important thing. He is the express image of his person. No one has ever seen God. But Jesus said he who has seen me has seen the Father. He said it in John 15. He said it in John 17. He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you have seen Jesus, if you have encountered Jesus. Now, you and I did not see him physically when he was here because he, he lived on the earth 2,000 years ago physically. But the Bible says that when we go into the word of God and we see him, then we are able to understand the image of the person of God. God is invisible. God is invisible. God cannot be seen with the eye. But what he did is that he sent Jesus, his son, to become flesh. And he took on the form that we can see and relate with. And ever since the word became flesh, the word also became that which we see. And we are able to see God. It is very important. And through this, we can relate very easily to the Godhead. Through the word of God, you can have conversations with the Father. 
through the word of God, you can have conversation, through understanding of the word of God, you can have conversations with Jesus Christ himself. And through the conversation, through the word of God, you can have conversations with the Holy Spirit. Now, it takes understanding to know who to speak to per time. There are times you need to speak to the Father. There are times you need to speak to Jesus. There are times you need to ask, oh, Holy Spirit, help me. It takes an understanding, but if you do not understand this, you will not go back to, please, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. If you do not understand that he is the express image of God's glory, it continues to limit you. He is the express image of God's glory, is the express image of God's person. And then number three, Hebrews 1, let's go back to Hebrews 1, 3, please. The Bible says, who being in the brightness of his image and the express of his image, upholding all things by the word of his power. This is another supremacy of Christ, the supremacy of the word. He upholds all things by the word of his power. We must understand that not only is Christ the creator of all things, but he also is the sustainer of all things. If he created your life, he is your sustainer. This is why you must understand that when you feel lack and when you feel loneliness and you feel pressure of this life, he did not put you into this life to leave you alone. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. He is there with you. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of time. He is sustaining your life. Never let the words of loneliness come from your mouth again. Never let it go out of your lips again because he upholds all things by the word of his power. All you need to do is to keep declaring the word. The Bible says when you declare the word, you will be justified. When you declare the word, you'll be justified. My famous story of the crossing of the lake in the boat with the storms showed us what Jesus did in Mark chapter 4, verse 39, when he said, peace be still. And the Bible says the people said, and the peace and, and, peace and uh, serenity reigned on the, on the seas, and all the wind stopped, and the waves went down. And the disciples said, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the seas, they obey him. What does that mean to us today? How many storms of life are you addressing? It's the same word of his power. How many storms of your life are you addressing? How many? How many? Those of us who are in the front line and going to the workplaces every day, before you go into those places, you address him. You address it. You will say, in this place, I arrest every flying and demonic spirit in COVID-19 or whatever virus it is. By the word of his power. Not your word. Not your word. The word of his power. The word of his power. You must take authority. You are finding things going haphazard with your life. You don't just watch it. The Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. If he had not spoken peace, be still. That day, the wind would have capsized that boat. The wind would have tossed that boat. Paul was having a similar experience in Acts chapter 27. He said, you guys do not be afraid. I have received the word. I'm paraphrasing. He said, I have received the word that there shall be no loss. There shall be no loss. The word of his power. Only the boat will be destroyed. There shall be no loss of any life. And so he spoke and as he declared, the Bible says that they reached shore. And he began to remind them that this is what God has said to me. And so we must understand that as a people, we have to keep declaring as he upholds all things by the word of his power. The third thing that God spoke to us in Hebrews 1, 3, the fourth thing is that God, Christ, purged the sins by himself. This is the uh, ninth proof. This is the eighth, sorry, seventh proof of my nine. Christ purged our sins by himself. This is my seventh proof. C Christ purged our sins by himself. Don't forget, the Jewish Christians were people who were used to the Levitical priesthood, they were used to sacrifices of bulls and, and, and uh, animals. And they were not, the concept was very difficult for them. They needed a priest to sacrifice the animal on their behalf on what they call the day of atonement. So when Christ came and he said, I did not come to abolish all that, but to fulfill it in one go. They were a bit confused. They accepted it, but after some time, their main brain could not comprehend it. Who killed him? Who sacrifices on his behalf? And then he began, the Bible now began to make them to see, the word of God now began to make them to see that this same Christ is the priest. He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the priest at the same time. So he purged 
himself. The Bible says he purged our sins by himself. He did not need any other priest to come and do that. This gives us a settled assurance on our salvation to understand that it has nothing to do with you, it has nothing to do with me, it has nothing to do with anybody but by himself. When we come to Jesus Christ, we are able to accept him as our faithful high priest who has sacrificed his life for us once and for all. In Hebrews 5, 9, the Bible says Christ became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. The author of eternal salvation. And having been perfected, thank you, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So if you want to enjoy eternal salvation, live in obedience. Live in obedience. You have obeyed to come to this faith. You have obeyed and you have released your faith. You have extended your faith to the grace that he shed and he gave to mankind. Now you continue to walk in obedience and you continue to enjoy the dividends of eternal salvation. Friends, many people wonder how it works. Grace saves you and saves you permanently. So how does it work? Listen, always remember the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son makes it clear to us. That man was always the son, but he suffered many things because of disobedience. He suffered many things and thank God he came back to his senses and went back to his father's house. So every time we walk in disobedience, it doesn't take us away from sonship. It only punishes us unnecessarily. He has become the author of our eternal salvation. Let us continue to remember his sacrifice and let us walk in obedience. Obedience is what helps us to keep enjoying the dividends of that eternal salvation from now and forevermore. This is why we must understand the place of what he has done. And the last thing he said in Colossians 1.3 is that he sat down at the right hand of God. Again, this means that he did that sacrifice once and that was it. That is our eighth proof. He sat down at the right hand of God. Let's quickly go through the proofs again. Number one, the Bible says in Hebrews 1, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, he was made, God made the world through him. That's the first thing. God made the world through him. The first thing we must understand is that Christ is the son of God through whom, sorry, Christ is the son of God through whom he speaks to us today. Then secondly, God made the world through him. And thirdly, he was appointed heir. Those are the three, verse, verse three, just quickly recapitulating. And then he, he, he's in the brightness of the image, that's the fourth. He's the express image of his person, that's the fifth. He's upholding all things by the word of his power, that's the sixth. And had by himself purged our sins, that's the seventh. And now has sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, that's number eight. That is to assure us that he is not coming back to make a sacrifice again. He is not coming back to have to sacrifice again. He has now sat down at the right hand of God. We know from Psalm 16 verse 11 that that right hand is where there are pleasures forevermore. So every time we know that he's making intercessions for us. This intercession is not what we understand by intercession. He is not crying for us. He just simply appears to the Father for your behalf and on my behalf. Every time the enemy is trying to rob us of the pleasures of this earth, because it is the Father's good intention to give us the kingdom, all he needs to do is just to rise, and, and that's why the Bible says, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And all he does at the right hand of God, the Father, is just he rise. Because he sat, he rises on your behalf and rises on my behalf. And the Father said, that is true. You have paid, my son. You have paid, my son. This one no longer deserves this pain. That's why when he was here on earth and he saw that woman that was bound down for 18 years, he said, ought not this daughter of Abraham be loosed from her infirmity? He's still saying the same thing today at the right hand of God. On your behalf and on my behalf. Ought not you be loose from your infirmity? Ought not you be set free? Ought not you? What is the point of you accepting his lordship if you are bowed down like everybody else? And I know this is very difficult for very, very re many religious people. They say, oh, how can you say people must not suffer? How can you say? No, 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 no. It is not about people must not suffer or people must not be in different situations. It is all about when we find ourselves in trials and tribulations, we have a redemption. 
That's the difference. Trials and tribulations will come to everyone. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations. So we are not talking about the trials and the tribulations not coming, but we are talking about our assurance, our guarantee that there is a redeemer that is alive. There is a redeemer that is now sat down at the right hand of God the Father, who is making intercession for you and I. Hey, friend, if you pray, you will pray differently. When you see a child who knows the parents, very well and that the parents love them the way they talk to their parents is very simple it's very simple i grew up by the grace of god with very loving parents i could walk into their bedrooms anytime thank god their own rooms is it's not like our own here that doesn't have <laughs> locks <laughs> so if i try the door is not working i go back but anytime i try i just walk in anytime then I say, Dad, you know, tomorrow I'm traveling back to school or blah, blah, blah. I'll sit on their bed. It makes no difference. My kids do the same thing to me today. Because the, the, the relationship between parents and children is that of a bonding of oneness. Why should we go to our father through Jesus and be crying as if we are, we are slaves, as if we are foreigners? We should be confident. The Bible says, let us approach the throne of grace and with, with confidence. Let us approach it with confidence so that we may find grace and obtain mercy to help us. We may, find, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. At the end of the month, we are going to have a very powerful session, the last Friday of the month, on the graceful encounters. This will be our fulcrum scripture. Graceful encounters where you go before the Lord and you just take what is yours out of the pleasures because he sat down at the right hand waiting for you and I to come for what is ours. Friends, this is not about bread and butter Christianity. This is about dominion. This is about taking your right and taking what belongs to you in Christ. The uniqueness of Christ is that he is no ordinary prophet. The uniqueness of Christ is that he is no ordinary person. He is no ordinary historical figure. He is God. The final point I want to make today is in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. We all need to understand that Christ is much better than the angels. The Bible says God has highly exalted him and has given him a name above every other name. This was necessary to be told to the Jewish uh, Christians because they revered angels. Many of them knew the story of angels with their, wrestling with their father Jacob the patriarch. They knew the place of where angels were involved in, in, in the lives of people like Daniel. They were aware of those things. So they respected angels as messengers from God. So they could not place, is Jesus better? Are the angels better? And the Bible says they had to tell them, like they're telling us today, that he has become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Verse 5 of Hebrews says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Verse 5. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. To who did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father. He never said that to any angel. Not even Gabriel. Not even Michael. The ones we know that he really, really gave errands and he virtually sent for, for, for the ministry of, of mankind, especially even with the announcement of the birth of Jesus. He never called them sons. He said, I will be to him. He said, which one did he say? I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6. Uh, verse 13. Let's go straight to verse 13. Because you can read from verse 6 to 12, talking about different things, about how supremacy of Christ is over angels. In verse 13, he said, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? Like Jesus is sat there now. He said, which of them did he ever say, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your food too? And verse 14 is where it now becomes our own portion. Verse 14. He said, are they not all ministry spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? They are all ministry spirits. And they are sent forth to minister for you and I. The word inherit salvation there means ultimate salvation. We are already saved. We already have salvation. But it's not talking about our ultimate salvation. When we finally leave this earth and leave this body. Friends, let us be confident. The devil is doing everything he can to distract Christians and make Christians fearful. God's word cannot be broken. I repeat it, the Antichrist, 
that is coming to rule this world in the time of tribulation has no right whatsoever to appear till Jesus comes to take us home in the rapture. Never ever let anything make you doubt or think otherwise. Otherwise, we invalidate the word of God. This is our assurance. He sat at the right hand of God the Father just waiting for the instruction to come for you and I. The question I want to ask you, my brother and my sister, is are you really ready? I am not asking if you've been going to church or coming to this church. Are you really ready? Are you still allowing dull moments? The Bible says he's going to come in the twinkling of an eye. Before you blink your eye, he has come and he has gone. And only those who are righteous, those who are right, those who are ready will go with him. And then the tribulation will come. We must understand that what Christ is expecting of us is to live ready. When we pray, we pray in expectation of his coming. When we pray, we pray in expectation of those mansions that he said he has gone to prepare for us. When we pray, we pray in expectation of the world and the life to come. Not only on these earthly things that are worthless. We all must understand that this is what it's all about. Every angel that has been dispatched to be ministering on your behalf, may they continue to deliver your goods to you in the name of Jesus. May no prince of Pasha withhold your blessings anymore. In the name of Jesus, I have been a benefactor of angelic ministrations all my life. I know they are real. I know they are potent. I know they do things. They move things. They put you in places. They help you. They close doors for you. They do things that you don't even know is happening. The Bible says they have been sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. You will continue to enjoy their ministry. But Christ is above them. So every time you relate with Christ... You put yourself in a position whereby Christ instructs angels on your behalf and God continues to speak for you. I just want to conclude by saying, before we take, break bread and take our communion today, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that this is the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3, 16. This is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, we're still going to do a series on this very, very deep things that God has spoken to me over the years about this scripture it will take some time, some weeks again, to look at this scripture alone. And you'll be shocked at what God has packaged in that one verse. He said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Don't forget, 1 Timothy 6, 6, the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. So this mystery, Colossians 1, tells us it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. This mystery is the mystery of godliness is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible says God was manifested in the flesh just like you were born physically in this world. The Bible says he was justified in the spirit just like you are born again and justified in the spirit. The Bible says he was seen by angels just like you are still being seen by angels today. The Bible says he was preached on among Gentiles just like he has made your life and my life the light of the world and the salt of the earth today. The Bible says he was believed on in the world just like God helps you to continue to see the fruits of your ministry coming to pass in people getting born again physically and people even becoming fruitful in your body and people are even physically being born because it is part of the dominion mandate. Just like you are being believed on, just like he was believed on in the world, that is how you are also having evidence and you will continue to have evidence. The Bible says finally he was received up in glory. This is what we are all waiting for. As to complete this mystery, the day will be received up in glory. It ends and we stop our movement of this earth and all these earthly pleasures. We become heavenly citizens in totality. We take on a new form just like he took on a new form. The Bible says we shall see him and we shall be like him. This is what the church should be doing. This is our message. To teach people about business and teach people about those things are good, but that's not our central message. This is the only thing that bankers cannot teach. This is the only thing that motivational speakers cannot give you. This is the only thing that the, the world experts of, of world economies and the best scientists and the, the Bill Gates of this world cannot give to you. The mystery of godliness is the secret given to the church. We will keep teaching it, we will keep believing it. Great is that mystery. God was manifested in the flesh. 
justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on in the world, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. May that be your portion and my portion perpetually till Jesus comes. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.